Yeah. You know what's interesting is the fact that these wigs Mm -hmm. were procured months and months ago. I know. And people have seen them in, like, some of the videos and stuff. And they go, why are there wigs in the background? What are with those wigs? People ask questions about the wigs. I've worn it once. Um, but we've not worn the wigs together. On I the show. wear it when I role play in bed. Yeah, Chris takes it all the way back to the uh, early 1700s. I stand over my woman. I'm like, grab them tally wags. <laughs> um, I think fitting for this episode um, because we are taking it back a little bit old school. We are also drinking f- f- the the lovely syrups of George Dickel. <laughs> <laughs> the crotch syrups of George Dickel, mm-hmm. um, which I will, I would say appropriately named GD. Mm-hmm. A good sip from the Dickel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's actually pretty good. Have you sipped it yet? It burns like ammonia. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So we're, this is a, an episode of which we decided we're going to take it back a little old school today. Thus the powdered wigs, but not the powdered faces. I thought about it. Just wig only. Um, yeah, it would be awesome if we could actually get made up, but yeah. um, you know, our 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 production skills are limited. <laughs> we can't. We don't have flour. We don't have any alternatives either. <laughs> we have literally no baby powder. Nothing. Nothing. Not to do it appropriately. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Well, I also kind of wonder because you know people are being um, essentially being like how many shows. And how many references to blackface and like people oh, like yeah. can't do blackface anymore. Yeah. I wonder if you go to the other extreme and just do extreme white face, what happens? No shit. Yeah. Like, like no one's doing powdered face. Yeah. No one's so, doing extreme white complain. face. Someone would complain. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably good that we just stick with the wigs. And even then, I feel like this is probably not culturally appropriate. I believe in a progressive world. That's the only way to move on, right? That's mm-hmm. the only way to evolve. But I feel like sometimes it's appropriate. To regress. Yeah, sometimes sometimes you got to gotta take just, a few steps back. You know, it's like, right. I, I know this is acceptable, but how about we treat it as if it's not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like a lot of people have done that, obviously, satirically, and then have just been burned at the stake by it. I'm expecting at some point it's going to be culturally inappropriate to, quote-unquote, own dogs. Oh, yeah. It already is. It's like... They, we don't own them. They aren't slaves. Like, they're family. Yes, but you know what? Even slaves were considered family. In some places. Not all. Not but, you know, some were... In, well, in the vast majority, not at all. I guess you wouldn't put family in shackles. Or in their own barn. Yeah, like, you're sleeping on hay. sleep on hay. Um, I did hear something interesting because I just went through the process yesterday of procuring a new home. Mm-hmm. That uh, Plantation. <laughs> yeah. They're no, they're, they're, a realtor's association is trying to make sure that when houses go on MLS, so when they actually go out into the world, mm-hmm. that master bathroom and master bedroom will no longer be the terms used to describe those two particular areas. Really? Yeah. Yeah, that's a real fucking thing. Master bedroom. Master bathroom. So what do you call someone in a profession who's considered master? You, I, you want it all. I have a feeling it will all change. Hmm. I really do feel that it, like the world is already being conditioned to those things will essentially change over time. What about masturbate? Yeah, you're just going to. Am I not the master of my own cock? Yeah, you are essentially. Do what I have to treat Chris, it nice? But Chris, in, in this society, everyone's the master of your cock. <laughs> you don't get to choose. Everyone else gets to you choose. You telling me I can't beat my own cock? Yeah, essentially. Man. That's harassment. What if your dick had to get its own social security number and like <laughs> <laughs> it became like its own citizen? <laughs> you will treat your dick with respect. Yeah. You can't shackle your dick. All dicks matter. <laughs> <laughs> It was weird. Um, so last week, obviously we didn't have an episode. And last week I took a just a. It was like a four Sabbatical. day vacation. Yeah, I I took I took some time <laughs> off, dude. I was like at the end of my sanity. It was like at an all time peak. And yeah. uh, so went to a place in Michigan called Grand Haven, which 
the way for me to appropriately describe Grand Haven is, well, I'll put it this way. Um, you know how like every, everyone's throwing around this idea of, especially here recently, like white privilege, right? Like a term thrown about to indicate like, obviously the color of your skin gives you an advantage, right? I, I'll be honest with you. I never felt that when I was younger. And I, I think either. part I think part of the reason is, and I'm not saying it didn't exist, but I think part of the reason was is like, like we didn't grow up until honestly we were probably 10, 11 years old. Like our mom, single mom, and our, obviously our dads in our lives, but they weren't together, so there's no dual house income. Yeah. Right. So it was mom essentially like supporting that effort on her own and has done so since. Yeah. But like we were poor. Like mom was, we were living in grandma's basement. That's and then true. we upgraded to this small fucking apartment in a like not great area. Yeah, Fox Hunt. And then evolved into a maybe 900 square foot house. Mm-hmm. And then mom got a job. She started making some real serious money. And then we moved more into like a middle class setting, right? Yeah. So for a while as kids, like I don't, you know what I mean? Like it's like we didn't have all this stuff, right? Yeah. So, like, I guess maybe for me, I'm not saying it didn't exist again, but, like, a disassociation from, like, the term. Like, I it just, like, in my head. But after going to Grand Haven, mm-hmm. I finally understand what white privilege is. Oh, yeah? And it is crazy. Dude, no joke. I saw two black guys the entire time I was there. It's the whitest place I've ever seen. Yeah. And not only that, the day we got there... People were protesting outside this guy's um, <laughs> corn dog stand. <laughs> what? This guy owns this really fucking reputable corn dog stand. Like we could see it. The only reason I know they were protesting is because we had this balcony facing um, Lake Michigan, mm-hmm. and the street below us is like one of the main streets in Grand Haven. And there's a, literally a corn dog stand, and there's just tons of people waiting for these delicious corn dogs at this corn dog stand, mm-hmm. right? But as soon as we got there, I opened the balcony, I could hear people chanting at this corn dog stand that was like right down the street. I mean, we could see it. And I'm like, what is going on? And then I could hear them chanting BLM. And I was like, oh shit, there's a fucking protest over there. I didn't know why they were protesting. I know it was two sides against each other. So it was like protest, counter protest. There was literally like this group and this group, and they're yelling back and forth. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck? Come to find out later. Um, my brother and brother-in-law and I, we went to a restaurant and we were just hanging out together and our waitress told us why they were protesting. And I guess the owner of the corn dog stand like made some remarks on Facebook mm. on his business, Facebook that were not great, not, <laughs> not great remarks. <laughs> and it, people were like, fuck the corn dog stand. I don't think you understand, ma'am. It is my right as an American to serve anybody who wants a black dog for my stand. <laughs> It's like black dog. We'll explain it. Well, it's simply put, it's a hot dog that's burnt to shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just keep them in the fryer longer. <laughs> um, it was weird. So we we finally got the backstory of it. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, it's so overwhelmingly white there. Yeah. That the next day, so many people were getting corn dogs. <laughs> Dude, the line for the entire day was thirty people deep, constantly. There's people, I watched a guy fucking pull, like, Edward Scissorhand corn dog hands. Like, he had them in between each of his fingers. He's holding them like this, eating them. <laughs> like, he had a fucking <laughs> corn dog claw. <laughs> and he's just smashing these corn dogs. So, relatively, I think the protest was relatively ineffective. But what I found out was, is that it is certainly, like, it's like, I, my, I think my wife said it best, and I think she said this two years. She's like, if you were to take... This is going to sound bad because I'm sure there's people that listen to us from Alabama. If you were to take someone from Alabama and give them money, <laughs> like they would be in Grand Haven. Oh, yeah. Now, it's a beautiful place. It's like the Hilton Head of the North. It's very, very nice. Yeah. It's, but, dude, trucks, truck after truck with Trump flags hanging off of them. Like It is very, very, very conservative white. And I was like, oh, that's what white privilege is. I mean, it was, like, super apparent. To the point where, like, there's times where, like, I kind of felt uncomfortable. Where I was just like, oh, this is just... It, it It had, like, a weird, almost Black Mirror vibe to it. Like, it was its own existence. Yeah. Like, there was, like, the people of Grand Haven don't know that there's anything outside of Grand Haven. Super strange. 
Very yeah. weird. Tons of money, but like a lot of hillbillies. It's like we're getting new new neighbors then this week. Oh, what are their names? And they're all excited. It's like uh, there's Catherine and Jamal. Jamal? Jamal. Jamal. <laughs> Well, he's white, right? No, he's black. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, it was weird. We watched, uh, there was two, I, 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 you take notice to it only because, like, it, like, literally the situation sticks out like a sore thumb, but there was two, like, we were on a patio, and there was two motorcycles, like, like, motorcyclists like harley riders and they're yeah. two black guys and they're walking through the main part of like green haven on the main street and dude people were just like staring at him watching him walk by and i was just like was it like blazing saddles is, moment dude legitimately i was like and they looked visibly uncomfortable no goddamn damn dang it it looks the sheriff is the yeah. sheriff is near <laughs> <laughs> that's literally dude it was just like that where people were like almost like taken back dude it was i'm telling you it was really strange Again, the place is beautiful, but it was, like, so strangely different. And yeah. in many instances, kind of uncomfortable. And even the waitress that we had at one of the restaurants we had, she, who was obviously very progressive, she had, like, the whole, like, shaved back of her head. I mean, you know those girls. Oh, yeah. Um, she was very – you could tell she's very – she <laughs> she was talking to Kevin and I, and she literally was like – she was telling us the story, and she goes, I fucking hate this place. <laughs> we, we were laughing because she would made some good points, and she kind of gave us, like, the back history of the town a little bit and, like, told us what it was really all about. And I was like, no, I kind of deduced that from, like, the first 15 minutes of being here. Yeah. I could tell that this is, like, rich white guy area and that if you aren't rich white guy, you're really not welcome. Yeah. It's very strange. Very strange. Hmm. Huh. And I feel like if you do have some sort of progressive mindset in Green Haven, you're likely to move. Like, you aren't going to stay the rest of your life there. It's just not going to happen. Dude, I'm, t I'm telling you, like... What, s what next? What next if Jamal moves in? What, are they going to put in a bus stop? Yeah. Well, you know what happens with bus stops? Black people come up bus stops, and they ruin the stores. They litter, yeah, that's they like, litter. And th that's, like, that's, like, essentially what I could hear. That's the growls that I could hear from the people that live there. Yeah. It was very, very, very strange. And, I mean, it was, like, there's more money there than I've seen, like, legitimately more money there than I've seen in most places I've been, minus Hilton Head, maybe. I mean, <laughs> we're talking, like, million-dollar yacht, like, multi-million-dollar yachts. I have pictures of some where you're just like, what the fuck? Town council, like, we're going to put in a Nike store. And everybody's up in arms, like, why? Like, Nike is such a rubber Do you know how many black people it will attract? Yeah. <laughs> it's just so weird. You're putting in a North Face? No. <laughs> yeah. Like everyone's protesting <laughs> things. Yeah. I could imagine that in a place like that. It's almost like someone should do uh, like a so like you should do some sort of sociology experiment there. Honestly. Oh, dude. Yeah. I think that would be like that is the kind of place where you someone needs to spend a considerable amount of time there there's to get like a better. Like I, I essentially feel like there's going to be a documentary about Grand Haven. There's probably a group of 10 to 15 older males who do a neighborhood watch, and they all carry tasers. Oh, God, I have no doubt. And no like, doubt. You know, and, like, <laughs> pistols, like, just making sure that their streets are so squeaky clean. Yeah, yeah, definitely a neighborhood watch group for sure. Yeah. I'm sure that ex I'm. I could almost guarantee that something like that exists there. Yeah, I can say some very uncoloring things just from the standpoint of just trying to make a joke to bring stuff to light of like how these people might think. But I think I'm going to hold off. Yeah, you probably should. <laughs> uh, there's definitely like a lot of Karens and Kevins there for oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Tons of fucking Karens. Karens are the on. worst. There's a, dude, it is a sea full of Karens. They Can are everywhere. Tell me if you've ever met a Karen with long hair. No. E never. 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 Yep. It's that short, what do they call it? Almost that pixie style haircut. Yep. It's essentially the same haircut you had when you were like a sophomore. They can't stand it. They get too hot headed. They can't have all that hair. It makes them <laughs> roast up. <laughs> I mean, how else are the horns going to come out? Exactly. Can't have hair covering it up. Yeah. Dude, yeah, it was, real, it was wild. But it was, you know, it was pleasant. I went tubing for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, didn't get tossed off the tube as many attempts as Kevin tried to make to <laughs> fucking make me hit my own wake at fucking 40 miles an hour. <laughs> no, but dude, my arms were like killing me. I've never tubed before. It's weird. It's like, I love, you know how I'm like, I love, I like going fast. Yeah. And it's weird to think that like, I've never done that before. 
I have never. It was really fun. We rented a boat for like four hours and just went all over the place. It was really we fun. We have, in the snow, hung off the back of an S or hung off the back of a, a truck with snowboards. Yeah, it was actually probably very. Uh, to me, it's like similar to that. Yeah. Yeah, it's very similar. That's cool. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It made me like tubing. It definitely made me want to get like a almost like a you know like a fishing ski boat or like some sort of pleasure boat because like being on the water is like. For me, it's like, that's natural. That's where I like to be, but I don't have access to that kind of water around here, really. Yeah. But it, like, it really made me want, I was like, dude, I want to be on the water more. Like, because that's where I feel best. It's like, like just being on a boat. You're a wannabe fish. Yeah, dude. I really am. I think that's my calling. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. You know, it was weird having a podcast week off, but I, it was so fucking needed. Like, if I would have done another one, I would have put a bullet in my fucking head. I, you know. I'm just kidding. It was mildly chill for me. Mildly. I just sat at home and watched some good action flicks. Anime? Yeah, some anime. Yeah, of course. Why not? Of course. I was watching this show called Curse, which is based on uh, Merlin and Arthur. What's it called? Cursed. I think that's the one Lauren's watching right now. Is that a Netflix? Yeah, it's supposed to. Ha- it's isn't like, that girl? Yeah, it's spo- it's supposed to be like what happens before Is it Arthur really? gets the sword. Re- oh, that's why she's carrying that sword yeah. around. It's before he gets the sword. Yeah, I think Lauren doesn't know why that show exists. I didn't either. But I'll I tell you what, the people up in Detroit or wherever you were would be pissed if they watched that show Grand because Haven. Arthur is black in it. Oh yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. I didn't notice that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Grand Haven is not going to be key Grand to that. Grand Haven would not like that show. I hope nobody from like the city of Grand Haven <laughs> reaches out to us <laughs> like, like, what the g- fuck are you doing? What if a good portion of our audience was <laughs> from, from Grand Haven? Yeah, that'd be crazy. <laughs> we didn't uh, endorse any of that racism. No, definitely not. Definitely not. Um, but yeah, it was, it was something else, man. It was something else. I feel like I would just go there just to stir shit up. I, I did stir shit up, <laughs> not in that way, but you know, it's like I go to certain places. I feel like people can't handle me. I'd be like, you like pudding? And you say, what kind of pudding? Well, do you like vanilla or chocolate? Chocolate. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you should move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could see it happening there. Like there is no Hershey chocolate bars. They're only like the white, <laughs> the white cream. <laughs> Dude, I wouldn't be surprised. It's fucking. I'm telling you, man. It no was a dark place. chocolate and green I will, haven. I will put it this way: they are all about wearing masks there. Are I they? mean, because it is it is a statewide mandate, mm-hmm. but they do it they do it the right way, man. Like minus the beaches, Jesus Christ. We we didn't even go to the main beach because I was like, this is a cesspool of Corona. Well, There's sure. no way I'm going to this beach I'm with sure. thousands of people. Yeah. But as far as like restaurants and stuff, man, they they had it down much better than Ohio. So like hats off to Michigan as far as like, you know, you kind of fucked up in the beginning and your governor's a psycho, but mm-hmm. they were all about compliancy with masks. No one like freaked out. And in a town of Karen's, I <laughs> anticipated a bunch of mask freakouts. Yeah. Dude, people were like super compliant. They like even the staff, the staff like Every place that you go to, either in Grand Haven or Grand Rapids, uh, it seemed like every place we went to had the just QR code for a menu, so they didn't have menus that you could touch. Yeah. And they just had processes in place that ensured as much sanitization as possible. So I really actually admire their effort on that. They they kicked ass. It's, again, much better than Ohio. Like, for here, I think some of the rules are a little bit looser. They're similar, but I feel like... It's just mandated harder there, mm-hmm. and I think the restaurants and the bars take it much more serious um, than they have in Ohio. Yeah, where it's a, th- I think once you get into an establishment here, it's a little looser. Well, think about it; they want to risk the chances of it getting shut down again, so they're going to yeah. be as strict as they. I can. I mean, they're they're essentially like it's a summer place for people to go. And there's a lot of money that goes through Grand. There's a lot of money in Grand Haven, dude. The boats there alone, millions. I have never seen that many. Million dollar boats. I mean, there's thousands of them. So exp- you should see the speed boats. We watched, <laughs> we watched. Um, we were in one of the main ports, which is like uh, essentially Grand River, which is the mouth that goes out into Lake Michigan. Yeah. We watched a fucking like caravan of like I'm talking high powered speed boats, like professional powered. They've got fucking goddamn. 
short block fucking V8s in them. Like, each one of those boats is probably half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. I think Kevin and I lost count of how many were going through the channel one time. They were having, like, a fucking speedboat rally or whatever. Like, they do races out in the fucking, you know, out in Lake Michigan. Dude, there was literally a hundred of them. And they're just all going through at the same time. And That's you're just sweet. like, Jesus Christ. That's sweet. Just people with way too much money. Do you feel like you're already getting syphilis wearing these wigs? Yeah, I'm itchy as shit. I'm real itchy. Yeah, there's something about these wigs that's not pleasant. No. Yours <laughs> yours now, it doesn't even look like a powdered wig. It, it you, you look like fucking Adam Lambert from like 2015. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Because the, the wig is not necessarily kind of, it's not really moving back on your head. Anybody? He's good. Find me. Do you, do you like him as Queen's new singer? Um, yeah, I mean, he's a good singer for the tracks. It's just like, I don't know. With the understanding that it can never be Freddie Mercury, how do you feel about it? I mean, it's like the same way with Journey, too, you know? Journey sucks, though. What? You lo Dude, Journey's terrible. Oh, is that an unpopular thing? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Journey. <laughs> listen up, everybody. Journey Here we stand. is terrible. Queen is a hundred times better than Rosa Journey. Rosa Parks found broken in two. two. I even think their replacement singer, he sucks. I think the original singer sucks. I think Journey sucks. Sorry, I just do. I don't like them. Sleepless nights. Then no one likes that song. I think people think they should like that song and they don't. It's kind of like Pink Floyd. Everyone's like, oh, Pink Floyd. It's like, you don't really like Pink Floyd. You just feel like you have to like Pink Floyd. They're, they're objectively not good. <laughs> it's very unpopular. I'm sure I'm going to get some hate. <laughs> but it's fucking true. Sorry. Same with U2. U2 is terrible. God fucking awful. And I can't get them. I cannot erase them from my iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I plug in my oh, iPhone, it just gets It's playing. because you get a free album. You get the you free album, and you can't get rid of it. You can't it. get rid of it. It's obnoxious, and you can't delete the iTunes app. So it's the default. It's literally the default music. Sunday, bloody Sunday. Wow, it's so terrible. <laughs> um, we do have a review today. We do. Did we cover everything we needed to cover? I mean... Oh, you have... Um, actually, before we do so, because... Because we decided to go old school on this episode, and we're drinking George Dickel, which has clearly been around for a long time because no one's named George Dickel anymore. No one. Um, Chris decided to look up some, I would say, historical terms. Slang euphemisms from the 1700s and 1800s. Yeah, let's go through, let's go through that list of those. Okay. I think these are very profound, and I almost want to use them in a sentence, but I think I'll maybe just give you the word first, and then you'd be like, okay, well... Give right, me an example. like use our imagination. Corey, do you know what a tally wag is or tally wags? I'll give you an example. Okay. I was playing basketball yesterday with a pair of good friends of mine, and when I went up for a layup, my friend owed me so hard in the tally wags <laughs> <laughs> that I had to go to the hospital and have blood drained out of them. Oh. So it's tally wags balls? Yeah. So it's not tally wag. It's not your dick. It's your balls. It's tally, tally wag. wags for testicles, but some people have one testicle. That is true. All right. Next. Oh, okay. Um, this one should be easily refreshable. Referenceable? Referenced? Referenceable? He went up to me and he grabbed my tackle. <laughs> oh, man. Before I knew it, I was totally engorged. I'm like, why this feeling? Why my tackle? Am I not a man? Or yet one who observes and adores and secretly also wants a man? <laughs> That said, he that's your that's your dick. Your dick. Yeah, Males that's your dickle. Male's genitals. Yeah. Okay. Yep. George Dickel's tackle. What else we got? Ooh. Okay. Here's a good one. I was traveling with a pair of adventurers, 
And we came across a farmstead with a beautiful maiden that greeted us at the front door of the inn. She walked up and she says, follow me to my room. I will show you a good time. And immediately I was struck in, almost as if, look at this beautiful maiden. She's gorgeous. She's so gorgeous. I feel like I'm in love. Before I know it, I'm interrupted by a man who quickly walks up to me. He goes, did you just talk to that woman? I said, yes, I think I'm in love. He goes, you do not want to mess with such a woman. I was like, why not? He's like, sir, I don't think you understand. That woman, that woman there is actually, let me look up the word again. <laughs> that woman is a hedge creeper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what did you say? What the hell is a hedge creeper? Do you know what a hedge creeper is? No, but these are all starting to sound like garden tools. <laughs> <laughs> a hedge creeper is a prostitute who presumably works in the countryside. <laughs> <laughs> I like how they identify her geographically. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, she's not an inner city street walker. She's a countryside walker. I was once at a party with Jay Leno, and a man came up, and he's like, Get out of here, you jib face. You have yet to pay your tab the last seven times you're in here. And Jay Leno got up and punched him in the face. And I'm like, why did you punch him? You owe him money. He's like, it's not for what I owe. It's for what he called me. And I said, well, what did he call you? He's like, he called me a jib face. And I said, what is a jib face? And he goes, an ugly person. <laughs> <laughs> Especially one with a heavy lower jaw. <laughs> Who the fuck identifies someone as being ugly by their jaw? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that guy. He's got a real ugly jaw. Yeah. Isn't yeah. like a pronounced large jaw a good thing? You would think it'd Isn't be, that typically like a masculine... You would think it'd be something that would be adorned for like royalty, right? Like someone with a big, strong, strong jaw. chin. Right. Yeah, like that man's... Not gonna, ugly. That man's gonna rule. <laughs> like... People with the fucking flat indented chins, yeah. they're ugly. He can't look up, his head's too heavy, but he sure has got a fucking strong chin. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I got one more for you. All right, one more. Let's finish this off strong. I went on a date recently. It was a blind date. A friend hooked me up with a woman. She was cute and all, and we sort of got along. I ordered a steak salad, and she ordered, you know, like a salmon plate with, you know, garlic, red potatoes. Before I knew it, but while we're waiting for our meal, I just couldn't help but tune her out. She was such a church bell. Uh, annoying. A talkative woman. Oh, <laughs> those are the worst. Those a the church worst. bell. A church bell. I wonder what the association is with that. Because I'm assuming it's because church bells are annoying. Yeah. <laughs> I like the example it gave me. Hey, man, sorry I'm late. Some total church bell on the street wouldn't stop lecturing me about Scientology. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That is great. Yeah. Those are good. I, there's so many of them, and I yeah, wish there's we a had ton. an hour to give you examples. Yeah, I could just do this. Yeah. We don't even talk about a cigar. This is... You thought you were getting a cigar review, but what you were really getting is a history lesson. Yes. And please use them amongst your family. They're not going to know what a fucking jib face is. No. Or a hedge creeper. I think <laughs> that would be the true test of all of this is to apply this in the real world. Yeah. Right? So my challenge would be for anybody who's listening is to take these terms and interlace them into conversations with family and friends or even coworkers. Yeah, man. And see what the reaction is. Yeah. I feel It's just like... Listen, we, we, we're in a culture that's so culturally, like, woke. Yeah, it's almost, almost have to hide terminology now. you got to hide what you say because it's yeah. going to offend someone. But if you give a word that they don't know what the fuck it means, aha. Right, right. Aha. Yep. You know? Like the word gay. Gay used to stand for a cigarette. Uh, that was a fag. <laughs> 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 Gay meant happy, you fucking retard. <laughs> Gay used to mean cigarette. <laughs> oh man, I'm so oh, sorry. Jesus. I'm so sorry. 
gay was happy. Fag. Yes, that was cigarette. And I still don't even think that's true. I think there's some. No, it's like you gave me a fag. I think there's a. I think there's a belief that that is actually not accurate. We but should probably fact check that. I'm pretty sure it was in Europe, actually. What else was there? Uh, there's well, there's some other terminology. It's the same way, which is just like culture retarded now, which is so retarded. <laughs> because culturally speaking, retarded was someone who was considered dumb. But we used it as a cultural term to basically say, stop being stupid. Well, let's not say dumb. Let's say mentally handicapped. Mentally, mentally disabled. Yes. I'm just saying. <laughs> from Jesus Christ. <laughs> from a I love how you are authoring a lesson <laughs> on cultural sensitivity. And you're like, retarded means dumb. <laughs> I can know it doesn't. I'm just giving you examples how we used it. Yeah. But yeah, don't. Don't say it like I say it. No. <laughs> it's what I'm saying. Yeah. Th- you no, know, like the fact that you can't. Hey, listen. When you're listening to this, this shit stays behind closed doors. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Headphones only. Do not blast this on the speakers. This is not a chance for you to then become woke as well and say, Chris was giving me an example, but I'm starting to think he's racist. <laughs> <laughs> this, if this podcast ends because of this, <laughs> Jesus There's Christ. There's no way, man. If you guys yeah. don't know me by now, fuck. Yeah. Of course. Hmm. Yeah, but we do uh, we do have to pause sometimes and think about what we say. That's true. I used to let things just kind of flow, just literally roll off the tongue. Hey, and now I've I've kind of have a piece of my brain that processes everything beforehand. Like I yeah. have this filter. Yeah, I have this like stopgap. It's essentially like imagine imagine a car like cars going down the street at sixty five miles an hour. And then you see the yellow light. What do you do? You start to slow down, right? You see the red light, you come to a stop. That's most of my thoughts now. Corey, listening to you talk was like riding a really fun, exhilarating roller coaster until you started becoming a little bit more aware. Because I'm going to be real with you. Riding a roller coaster where I'm stopping every 10 feet. Yeah. Sucks. Not a fun it sucks. Roller... It's not as exhilarating. It's not a fun roller coaster. It's not fun. That's just in a straight line. Yeah. It's just like, uh... Yeah. Yeah, it sucks. I'm not going to pay for it to go to that theme park again. I've actually, weirdly enough, I in, in private, I'll put it this way. In private, or if it's around people I'm very comfortable with, that side of me comes out naturally. Mm. And I, there's typically no reservation. I just say whatever the fuck I normally say. Yeah. But it's a little different now. It's a little different. It's not even because I feel like I need to be sensitive towards other people. Like, personally. Like, I have some sort of social responsibility. It's literally just not to upset the apple cart. Like, I'm like, I just don't, I cannot handle a reaction from anybody at this point for saying something that contextually people don't understand or don't have any sort of idea. Of like, for example, like you going on your rants about racism and all that stuff. Yep. That stuff, when you and I are talking and the collective audience knows, like, this is Chris being satirical. It's, it's being funny. Yeah, if you don't realize it's that. It's certainly obviously not representative of who you are as a human being no. at all in the least, furthest fucking from it. But there are literally people who would take that, just the subject in and of itself, and just turn it on its head. Do you know why words are more powerful than they used to be? Mm, no, but I do remember the saying, sticks and stones shall break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I don't know what happened with that. Do you know why? I feel like it's the opposite now. Because you can't use fucking sticks and stones anymore. Oh, that's true. You take away sticks and stones and all you have is words. Yeah, words, words become have a much for, stronger meaning. That's true. You can't just beat the shit out you of You can't just anymore. like have a disagreement with someone and beat them to death and not right. say a word. Well, you don't have to beat them to death. You could just beat them. Well, you get my point. You're just getting a fight. You're getting a fight. But you could you could handle something without using a single word, right? And make your case, right? Old school. It's like I sleep with your wife. It's like, yeah, you know, right? Dead. I didn't have to say a word. I didn't have to call you a motherfucking, you know, like no personal attacks yeah. or like shit. Yeah, I didn't have to say anything. The minute you go like I sleep with your wife, it's like, man, if I could shoot you right now, I would, but uh, I can't. You're you son of a bitch. Yeah, you you're going to... Su- you fucking cradle-robbing, nest-hangling motherfucker. Yeah. Right. I slept with my woman. Coming out with all the you hot start personal coming out with all the. You come out with all those harsh words, man. And then that person goes, oh, man. 
Those are so hurtful. Yeah. When before, there was no hurtful. You were just dead. You know, it's weird. I never thought that I would enter into a period of my life as somebody who is firmly implanted in what we call the millennial generation Mm -hmm. and literally look at people who are a little bit younger than me and just go, wow, these, these people are pussies. Like, frightfully. Yeah. It's hard for me to look at certain people that are, I would say, anywhere from, like, the 18-year-old age time. Like, even up to, like, 30 years old. Like, some real fucking pussies. Like, uh, me it's and, tough. Me and Corey are considered veteran millennials. Yeah. You well, know? kind of. We're, we're, the f- we're the firstborn. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely the firstborn of the... We're the firstborn, you know, yeah, millennials. Yeah. And even I shudder sometimes. Oh, God, I'm dude. just like, oh, is that literally what yeah. we're doing? Cringeworthy in terms of, like, people's sensitivities and... I don't know, man. I just think some people, like, live in weird bubbles. You know what I mean? Like, the whole safe space thing, and you can't say that, and, like, damning people for having an opinion that differs from yours. Like, I just never... I guess I didn't catch on to when it all really started. I just took notice after it had already begun. Where I was like, was that really a fucking thing? And then I just, dude, I see a world full of fucking pussies. And it's tough to watch. It's tough to watch. And like, they're not all like that. but there's No, but there's a considerable amount, the man. The ones that really make a concerted effort to stand out, they are. Jesus. It's just I'm mean, like, dude, you've got to be able to find something else to do with your time. Because this is maddening. I have a prediction, though. Mm-hmm. 2020, and we'll move on after this, 2020 sure. presidential election. Yeah. No matter the outcome, yeah. shit's going to burn. Mark my words. Oh, yeah, there's going to be riots. Shit will burn. There's there be is a very specific reason why I have chosen to move at this particular point in time. That is one of the variables where I was like, I don't want to be as close to the world burning as what I could potentially be. And I want to isolate myself. You want outside of the blast radius. I, as, as closely as I could. When those bombs fall on our great utopian American, I know you all think it's utopia, but we are a very complex, confused nation. Mm, that's true. But when those bombs fall on us, you don't want to be in that blast radius. In fact, no. you want to be off the grid. You want to be in the Appalachian, the Rockies. You want to be... In a remote location. I'm not that remote. I'm not even close to that remote. But I'm just south of, I'll be south of where I'm at now. And, and it's just, it's it's a migration, a separation a little bit from, it just, it's a, it's a means, it's just part of the variable. But I, dude, I just have, it's weird. I was telling this to my wife the other day. I think it was her that I was talking to where I said, literally in the, like the first time in my life, you know, when you talk about like, controversial elections, which I would argue the last one was probably the most controversial, especially in our lifetime, Um, especially with who's president now, right? Sure. And I was, we were talking about this, and I I literally said, for the first time in my life, I'm genuinely scared about an outcome that would go either way. Like, in terms of the election. Like, I'm genuinely scared no matter what happens. The puppet... Or the rogue billionaire. Yeah. Or the senile, or the dementia-based puppet. Yep. Or the stubborn billionaire. Yeah. Yeah. Like, which one can ruin the world faster? Uh, yeah. It's pretty maddening. And then every other country outside of us is just laughing their fucking That's asses off. That's why 2020, I'm voting for Kanye. Yeah. Did you see his meltdown? No, 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 no. God, that Kill was harsh, me. man. His fucking meltdown was hard to watch. Can only make me stronger. stronger. No, 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 no. I hope you hurry up now. Because yeah. I can't wait much longer. Did you hear his new song? No. Horrible. Nearly. It's horrific. Did it's he, so bad. Did he lose it? He already lost. I mean, he's lost it. He lost it a long time ago. <laughs> but, dude, it's so fucking bad. I do like Jay-Z's laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, let's get in this review. Sure, sounds good. So we said we were taking back old school, and we were committed to that promise. Very committed. Today we're reviewing, uh, I want to say, a relatively new but old school cigar. Yep. Um, Comes to us from uh, our buddies at Protocol Cigars. Uh, We are reviewing the Sir Robert Peel. Maduro. 
Maduro. It's a yeah. very interesting cigar. It's so off color to the rest of the brand. Yes. Very much so, both in branding and presentation and naming. Yeah. I was like, wait, that's a protocol cigar? Well, it does have its association it to lo- law enforcement, but yes, but I know what you're saying. But unless you know who Sir Robert Peel is. Yeah, you wouldn't, uh, yeah, you'd have to look that it's up. Like, is like that a guy that like runs a fruit farm? I don't know. <laughs> but I'll give you kind of a little two minute or maybe a minute on Sir Robert Peel, okay? Shoot. Sir Robert Peel. Second baronet was a British conservative statesman who served twice as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and twice as Home Secretary. He is regarded as the father of modern British policing. That's interesting. Modern British policing. Don't carry firearms. From the 1700s. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it's it? It's a bit of an oxymoron. I mean, they only carry billy clubs, and they wear those silly hats, so yeah. it kind of makes sense. Marry you. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when they get too far away? You got to throw your billy, throw club, your at billy club at them? Throw your billy club at them, for sure. God I think they carry tasers now. That's true. I think they do. But I hear they have a lot of stabbing issues. Dude, it's r- it's rampant over there. Yeah, stabbing they is stab like the fuck out of everyone. Yeah. yeah. Done. It's a silent killer. I peeled you. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that's a term for knifing someone <laughs> in prison. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I want to peel your skin. I peeled you, bitch. Yeah. So we did smoke this in the Maduro. He is our great grandfather, by the way. I am Reginald Akeem Peel the fourth. <laughs> that's true. Very yeah. true. I'm pretty sure that somewhere on my mother's side, we have a great great uncle who's black. That's where I got Akeem. Yeah, that would make sense. It would make sense. Um. Yeah, so this is the Maduro, but mm-hmm. it also comes in a natural. Ooh. This particular Vitola that we're smoking is in a 7.5 by 49, and this is for the owners, essentially, of Protocol only. Mm-hmm. So they were nice enough to send us um, this large Vitola. These only come in what would be like a traditional Toro size, mm-hmm. which is 6 by 52. So what you can actually get your hands on in the marketplace if you want to purchase these cigars is 6 by 52. And again, we were lucky enough to get our hands on um, the rare form of the Sir Robert Peel in the seven and a half by forty nine, yes. which is such a strange vitola. For sure. Um, what else do we got? Let's get into the stats of the cigar itself. Oh, I, I forgot I should do the introduction. Oh yeah. When you're a week off, sometimes you forget where you're at. Yeah, 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 for sure. You kind of lose a little. Yeah, bit. and the introductions kind of change. It's kind of like Michael Jackson when he stepped into baseball and came back to basketball. I was like, well, he's not really on his game yet. I'm sorry. Did you say Michael Jackson? <laughs> Jordan. <laughs> Which, by the way, I am watching the I last dance it. documentary. It's very good. So goddamn it's good. It's very good. I'm I, not done with it yet, so don't spoil it. I'm in episode seven. Oh, I'm like way further than you. Okay. There's, I feel like there's a billion episodes. Yeah. It's super good. It though. is so goddamn good. I'll do this in my Reginald, Reginald, <laughs> Akeem Peel the Fourth voice. Each cigar review is broken down into three main categories construction, burn, and flavor. To throw in a little extra kicker, we see if the cigar is worth the price for a possible bonus or deduction. And then finally, we average out our individual reviews, giving you guys our total recommendation. Mm. Yeah. Tune in to last episode, two weeks ago, the Baca, where we introduced this new grading scale. But uh, essentially what we're doing is no more scores. I know you guys like them. We don't. Yeah. And the only scoring system that will be applicable this point going forward would be the community rating. So that'll give you an o- that would give you an over idea. That would give you an idea and an overall score of what the collective cigar community feels about a particular cigar. Yeah. So we'll give you kind of a a general recommendation term at the end of this review. So, yeah. Let's get into it. Okay. Stats of the cigar. Rapper type. Go for it. Pennsylvania Broadleaf, which is actually not used. So when it is used, I really enjoy it, but it's not really typically used all that often. I feel like it's more apparent these days than it typically has been in the past. But as a rapper. Yeah, I've only seen as a rapper type. I've seen it a few times. Yeah, not many. Um, Nicaraguan binder, Nicaraguan filler, which isn't surprising coming out of the Zona factory, um, which is where all the protocol cigars are manufactured. Again, the Vitola on this, I just put giant 
at a uh, seven and a half by 49. Now the traditional six by 52 Toro is right at about the $12 price point. Yes. Which is essentially, even though we reviewed this cigar, we want to keep the $12 price point in mind for anybody who wants to procure now, Corey's, this Robert Now, Corey's was a solid circle, Vitola. It was as close to a circle press as I've seen. Yeah. My, Whatever that may be. You know how there's like a natty and a natty light? Well, I'm pretty sure mine's a box press light. Yeah, it was almost like... um. It's like uh, the box press who could never be. Yeah. Like, the, it's just a failed box press. Or a bloated box press. Yeah, it was weird. It was like, looked like it was intentionally supposed to be box press, and then it just kind of bloated out into a fucking cylinder like, again. Like someone who used to be chiseled, but then kind of like lost it. A little it flabby. And they gave up. Yeah. And they get a little chunky. Yeah, for sure. Um, it was a very lazy box press. <laughs> it was a very lazy box press. I'll put it that way. Um, all right. Overall construction of cigar, Chris, how did you feel about it? I'll tell you what, brother. I, you know, the thing is, is I'm gonna actually going to start with the label because I mentioned it earlier, which is this is so atypical to a protocol cigar yeah. in terms of branding. Yeah, like very much I so. literally thought it may have been a completely different brand altogether. Yeah, if you're talking about um, like Sir Robert Peel being the label. Being the label and the label itself. Wasn't a brand consistency with this one. This is Zero. a far departure from the other Zero, things, right? yeah. Yeah, there was no uh, like affiliation. You didn't see the protocol label on it nowhere, not that I was aware of. But. And it was just, it looked like more of a traditional cigar. Like it kind of has that antique feel to it. And yeah. you got a face on it, like a portrait. Right. Not typical of protocol. Right. Which may be a sign for the future. We'll see. Yeah. You know, could be. But that said, it was kind of like a chocolate wrapper. Mine was darker than Corey's. Mine had some, like, dark marbling to it in that Pennsylvania um, broadleaf wrapper. I will say, though, this. Like, typically, we'll see cigars in the darker color have a little bit of sheen, a little bit of oiliness. Right? Yeah. A little bit of greasiness. Yeah. You this know? is uh, drier than a popcorn part. This was drier than shit. And I will tell you, like, probably intentional of a, P- a Pennsylvanian broadleaf. Probably. I don't know. I haven't had many of them as a wrapper. But that said, like, there was no oily sheen whatsoever to it. Yeah. Zero. It was very matte. It was like a matte finish. Yeah. All, all in all, it was a pretty strong, well-packed cigar, even in its length of seven seven and a half by 49, the ones we had, which you'll experience a very similar ring gauge, not same length, but in some of the other Vitolas. But it was pretty well-packed coming from the Lazona factory. Um, and it, for this box press light, it was, you know, it's pretty rigid. Yeah, pretty rigid. I, I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. It was, we- was kind of weird because you have this lazy box press... <laughs> <laughs> um, and then kind of coupled with that, it was v- kind of bumpy and wavy and it was very rigid. Um, my particular cigar, which mimicked yours fairly closely. Yeah. Um, minus the color. Mine was much lighter shade, which I thought was weird. It actually was more indicative of the natural color and the other Sir Robert Peel yeah. cigar, it's which is, lighter. The, it just seemed, it was a lot lighter. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, I couldn't help but notice like there's a lot of protruding veins in the cigar the construction to me seemed to be very primitive almost, which is not something I hated oddly. Cause the, the other cigar, the other cigar that it kind of reminds me of in terms of like construction quality would be one of my favorite cigars, which is the EP Korea La Historia. Mm-hmm. It's not ever a really smooth cigar. It's bumpy. It's rigid. It's got the veins and it has that same similar, like print. It's almost like, you know, uh, the fucking Geico, um, Gecko? No, the uh, <laughs> the caveman. Like oh, the, he yeah, was just yeah. sitting in his cave with a fire, just trying to like bunch this together yeah. and roll it and the whole thing. It just seemed to be. It just didn't seem to be as artful as some other cigars that I've seen, and that that's coming off of literally smoking the cigar before I smoked was a Placencia. So yeah, make the comparison. Um, but I thought it was okay. Like I thought it was pretty good construction. Yeah. I did have one wrapper tear that was actually underneath, and I didn't notice it until it was exposed by actually removing the wrapper. And it, I don't think it was because the wrapper. I think it was already just kind of torn. Weirdly enough, in this Pennsylvania Bradley, it's a very thin wrapper. So it did seem to be a little bit more fragile to me. 
Um, but there was a, a pretty good tear right underneath the the label that was on the cigar. So that was kind of like, I, I guess it's I, it wasn't super harsh, mm-hmm. um, simply for the fact that everything was more towards the head of the cigar. So really noticeable, obviously, and the last part of the smoke and that final third. But I would say this, I would just caution people with it being a relatively thin wrapper, at least in the cigar that I smoked, just kind of handle with care. Yeah. But I'd say overall it was pretty good construction. What do you think about the burn? Burn I thought was pretty solid. You know, like it was more so on a regular traditional round Vitola than it was a box press. Um, that said, like it, it, it still drew like a box press, if that makes sense. Like it was super yeah. airy. Yeah. Um, it produced a really nice, nice light ash, like light gray ash. It only took about two to three puffs to like really get good smoke production. I did find myself at other points really having to chief on it. Like occasionally I'll be like, okay, four or five puffs to get some good smoke out of it. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's just slow burning fillers. You're, you're dealing with a lot of Nicaraguan. I don't know how much Lajero is in it. And I'm still kind of new on the Pennsylvania broadleaf, like how right. that, that as a wrapper type burns. So I was kind of surprised by that. But that said, it drew pretty well. Uh, very easy to draw. Um, it was it was it was a pretty solid burn experience. You know, I you know, we do this whole test thing. You know, it's important. We do it. We sit it down for five minutes. You know, we go onto the interwebs. We research some taboo fucking euphemisms and terms from <laughs> seventeen eighteen hundred dollars. You know, eighteen hundreds words. And you know, you come back after five minutes of learning some really cool words that you can say to your enemies. And um, if it's still lit, that's a good hold test. Yep. Mine, no problem. I mean, it was it, it stayed lit. I, I only had to touch it up once, but that was just me being fickle. <laughs> like I was like, hey, yeah. I just kind of want to touch it up a little just bit. Just a quick one? Yeah, just a real quick one. But it burned really well. I had no issues with it. It, bur- it burned pretty solid. I was a little concerned that it was going to burn too much. I mean, it's like, if something's this dry, this should be put in some fucking kindling. This should be put into some bonfire. Right. Like, it's so dry, I can, like, you know cook some food on or something. You know? <laughs> uh, I agree in terms of that it's a pretty good burn. Um, I had an exceptional draw on mine with a lot of good smoke production. So obviously probably the two things that I really admire and enjoy the most about smoking a cigar other than the flavor is making sure that you do have a good draw. Um, so this cigar achieved just that, which, you know, definitely on the plus side of the ledger. Where I had trouble was, and I didn't anticipate I would because I, I kind of looked at this and I said, okay, well, this is a seven and a half inch cigar, so you got much more real estate for things to go wrong. And it smoked really good. And after about six inches, I was like, oh, this is going to go the distance. And I expected it to go the distance. And guess what? It didn't go the distance. Um, so I did get an abrupt outage towards the end, probably with about an inch and a half, two inches of the cigar remaining, about an inch and a half of the cigar remaining, and uh, had to actually relight it. One of the things I did notice about this cigar, and I didn't, I intentionally didn't touch it up. We talked earlier about the construction as far as like it's kind of wavy, it's kind of rigid. You've got some of those protruding veins, which are all things in a cigar that could cause a weird burn. So I kept getting this like way, just a nice wave pattern on the cigar. It's like one side would burn and the other side would catch up. And I was just kind of waiting for one part of it to run a bit, but it seemed to always self correct, which I thought was strange. And I'm glad it did. I held off from touching it up just because I really wanted to see how it smoked before it was a necessity. And I thought it was kind of cool in the fact that, like, even as weird as the cigar looked, <laughs> it burnt really well. Yeah. And did kind of self-correct. And I would say not the most even burn I've ever seen on a cigar. Um, but the fact that it didn't create any challenges for me beyond just kind of being wavy, I thought was pretty good. So, um, overall, pretty damn good burn. Admired the draw greatly. Fucking draw on that cigar for me was beautiful that's good Corey. what do you think about the flavors i'll tell you what this was an interesting one to smoke um i will say this coming from protocol this one has more sophistication i think than most of this protocol cigars i've had um you get a lot of bitter and spiciness up front um and very prominently a woody essence to it this one had like you know, it just, I don't know what it was. It just like, some people say cedar, some people say 
tastes like oak. Some it's like well, yeah. Some people say campfire burn. Campfire there. burn. Like it had this woodiness about it that was like very prominent the entire time. With it being very heavily bitter and spicy up front, it did mellow out a little bit on that. But the spice was always consistent, and it's very consistent even with the brand where. Protocol, if you smoked any of their other lineups, they're known for producing relatively spicy cigars. Yeah, usually pretty pepper heavy. Yeah, very pepper heavy. You get the same thing with this one, in my opinion. But it is it does have a certain amount of more sophistication with the blend itself. Um, maybe it's just maybe there's some nuances about the fillers that have changed in this blend that they're not disclosing. Maybe it's just the Pennsylvania Broadleaf, which I'm not really accustomed to as a rapper. But while the spice lingers and that woody remains prominent, you do occasionally get weird change-ups in it. Real subtle. I'm not talking big roller coaster hills here. But I'm just talking about like little subtle change-ups where you get yeah. maybe a little bit more smoothness, maybe a little bit more creaminess. Maybe the bitterness kind of subdues a little bit. But it always comes back to those same three notes. Bitter and woody and spicy. But there are moments where it does make little subtle changes. And you're like, oh, those were pleasant. Like a couple hits of that, and you're like, oh, now it's back. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really nice. And even with the, the huge Vitola we had, which I would imagine you'll still get in the, in the smaller Vitolas, it was pretty freaking pleasurable. And like, I, if you've known me, I like spicier cigars, like bold flavor cigars. I like complex cigars. Those are blanket statements. I get that. If you're a newbie, you're like, what the fuck does that even mean? I was like, well, I don't know. I'm just doing a review. But this <laughs> was pretty damn good, and it really hit yeah. my, my flavor palette a bit. It really did. Yeah, I'm with you. I actually, I enjoyed how all over this place, uh, all over the place, the cigar is. Really, one of the things that I thought, and it kind of gave me a little glimpse into what I assumed was going to be a very apparent part of the flavor. Um, just even on the cold draw, I, I really got a lot of that dark fruitiness, which I enjoy in a cigar. Um, not not typical of some Maduro cigars that exist in the world. Um, I like that dark fruitiness, mm -hmm. and sometimes you get it on the cold draw, but then it dissipates really once the cigar starts burning. This one was actually quite different in the fact that like what was very apparent on the cold draw was one of the most predominant flavors that I got in the cigar. So I really like that. I think it enriched the cigar to a high degree. Um, it does come really hot and heavy with the pepper, which is pretty indicative, as you've already said, of Protogol cigars, and it wasn't anything that I was turned off by. I thought it actually added a level of balance to some of the sweet that you get. Um, but I do agree with you. You'd actually mentioned something in terms of subtle flavor change-ups, and I agree. There's all these little kind of turns. Mm -hmm. It seemed like once you got acclimated to one flavor, it changed to another. Mm -hmm. Like everything in the cigar changed so often that you couldn't really get used to or acclimated to a particular flavor of the cigar for too long. It was always kind of throwing another it, – it's like a pitcher throwing a different pitch at you. Here comes the changeup. Here comes the fastball. Here comes the slider. Here comes the curveball. And just kind of going through that rotation, which I actually liked because that helps kind of suffice my ADHD a little bit. Mm -hmm. I kind of like those changeups. I get bored with things very easily. So having a cigar that keeps me on my toes I actually quite admire. Um, there's a point in the cigar and about halfway through – where you get a bittersweet combination. And that for me was the that was the marker of the cigar where I was like, wow, this is really good. I love that particular portion. Unfortunately, not as long lasting as I hoped it would be, because you do get some of that predominant um, that pepper kind of like rears its head again yeah. towards the end. What I got in terms of, and I know you said even from the onset, you got a lot of that woodiness. I got that towards the latter half of the cigar. Where to me, even on the retro hail, it became much more full of that like woodiness, that campfire type, those campfire type notes, and even not on the retro hail, that seemed to be the predominant flavor profile. So again, another quick change up that to me kind of finished the cigar out. But my the beef of the cigar, the meat of the cigar at the halfway point to me was where the best flavors lied. Mm -hmm. um, although I will say, even at the the you know first third, final third, beginning, ending of the cigar was actually really enjoyable. I like the cigar a lot. This, to me, from Protocol, is definitely, and I agree with you, the most sophisticated cigar that they've produced. You're pulling my leg. This is so not like you. Don't you tear it, it'll me. Don't you tear 
teradiddle me? No idea what that means. It means to fibble lie. Oh, I'm not teradiddling your diddle. <laughs> I, yeah. I really, really thought, to me, this is the best protocol cigar that I've smoked yet. I'm going to show some thighs. How's that? That looks fantastic. Oh, yeah, you can see. Oh, dude, you're going to blind the fucking screen with those pails. Jesus. Hey, look like Casper. <laughs> um, so in terms of a price point, the traditional Toro, which is the 6x52, comes in at $12. Yeah. Where would you – would you say that that's a good value for this particular cigar? What do you think that like – I'm looking at saying protocol cigar, $12. Wow, that's a – premium i think about other cigars in the 12 dollar category and i go wow there's some real good shit out there or yep. even sub 12 dollars yeah so where do you think that falls on that spectrum of value well i gotta say Corey, you know there's a lot of history to this cigar a lot of things were taken to consider things learned from the past i think yeah. that's what's important yeah things learn from the past how do you learn from the past how do you move forward and i think protocol has learned some things along the way that has allowed them to create something that's iteratively and positively better than what they've done in the past. Yeah. And their price point for a lot of the previous cigars has always been around nine, ten bucks. Yeah. And then you come across this one, sophisticated, complex, out of the blue, relatively speaking, cigar called the Sir Robert Peel. And when you consider that, and you consider how much they've improved in their blending for this cigar. While I feel like it's on the high, it's on the high side. It's believable enough for me, yeah, to buy it at a twelve dollar price point. Yeah, it's believable enough. So I think it's the right price point. A little high, it's teetering, but I think it's the right price point for it. I would say if I were considering the total protocol lineup, I would say this is too high of a price. Yeah, that would be my preconceived idea going off of brand representation only after smoking the cigar and i'm saying this relative to what i believe a six by 52 would represent from a value perspective i think it's right on teetering as well yeah it's like right there where you're like eh. but objectively and even from an opinion perspective i would say this is definitely the best protocol cigar that has been blended, that has come to market. I agree. Personally for me. Smoked all of them. Yep. Smoked some of the Exclusives. special edition stuff, right? This, to me, is probably, I would say from flavor perspective, the complexity of this cigar, which somehow maintains a sense of balance. Mm. I have no idea how it does. But it keeps you on your toes. It keeps things changing. I like that a lot. Again, suffices that ADHD that I have. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really good. Yeah. So where does it fall for you in terms of recommendation? Well, Corey, based on all of this, you know, the construction was great. Burn was pretty solid. Flavor was surprising in a positive way. Yeah. Uh, some great improvements to how they blend their cigars, and I think they made a really good one with the Sir Robert Peel. Um, price point, while it is high, I, it's believable enough for me. Right. After smoking it, it's believable. Right. Um, I really thought this was a highly recommended cigar. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. I think um, I think Protocol took the time and picked a winner. Yep. I'm curious about the natural. I am too. The natural, I think, is more heavily reviewed than the Maduro, which is why I'm kind of glad we went with the Maduro. I allowed you to choose. Yes, I was going to suggest you smoke the natural. I smoke the Maduro, the Maduro, and then we have a we have a peel off. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was good that we did the Maduro together because it gives the opportunity for us to do the the natural, and maybe we'll make a comparison between the two. Yeah. I honestly, given how good this cigar was, like you said, in a surprising way, I have a hard time believing the natural is going to be better than the Maduro. I do too. I'm and curious enough, but I don't think it's going to be better. And the only reason I picked the Maduro. And this is kind of after the fact because I was thinking we were dealing with a traditional broadleaf like Connecticut. Finding out it was Pennsylvania, I'm like, okay, now I'm even more interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was more intrigued too, for sure. If this because I holds like up. Pennsylvania tobacco in small amounts is how I've always said it. Like I like it as a filler in small amounts. But you know what? That I agree with you. But that dynamic changed with me when I first smoked the Boondocks, which is 
heavy Pennsylvania. Yeah. It's wrapper, it's binder, and it's part of the combination of fillers. And that cigar is so good. Yeah, that's true. I think if done correctly, utilized correctly, I think it offers up so much to a cigar if it's done right. And I think in the Sir Robert Peel, it was done the right way. I, I really like the flavor combinations of the cigar. And I love, honestly, even though you can't buy this Vitola, I think where you get all those change-ups is like, hey, you have a seven and a half inch cigar. You're smoking through something that's an inch and a half longer than the traditional Toro 6x52 that they mm-hmm. have in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering how that differs. But I would say either way, I agree with you in terms of like you're still going to get a lot of those similarities no matter the Vitola. Um, I think it's highly recommended. I really like this cigar. Our great-great-grandfather will be so pleased mm-hmm. to hear how his cigar is done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, my voice He's is celebrating in his grave. My voice is starting to go to like the guy in Galaxy Quest. Like, yeah. we have no hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. That's weird. That's kind of funny. Um, cool. Let's wrap it up. I got shit to do. Baseball's on tonight. I know the Reds, right? Yep. The Reds are playing. Everybody's like, oh, baseball, it's coming back. Yeah, no, here's the thing. I don't like baseball. I don't like watching it, but I'm going to a friend's house mm-hmm. um, because I'm... Who are you s- going to? Bournes. Oh. Yeah. I'm so... dead. You can come with me for a little bit. I'm literally going, l- like, right when I leave here. Kale's with, with mom. I can hang out for a little bit. Okay. Yeah, come on over. Yeah. Um, I'll bring some alcohol. So, yeah, so he's watching the Reds. We're just a couple people that are coming over, and we're going to hang out on his back patio, which is always dope. And uh, we'll watch baseball because I'm so desperate for sports right now. I just don't even care. I'll watch anything. I'll mention it to mom because I'm sure she'll be. By the way, side subject for you. Can you just hold her for a minute? I got to talk, talk to Corey about something. You know what's interesting? Because mm-hmm. we're both moving south. Yeah. And, like, mom's, like, super upset about it. Mm-hmm. Like, I've been trying to, like, have Kale over there. Yeah, as much as fucking possible in the week, like like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Yeah, just to get her time in to where she gets maybe to the point where she's like annoyed by him. She's like, "Fine, fucking move." Yeah, you know. Yeah, she hasn't reached that point yet. Not worked. No, nah, it's not working. Okay, I think it's just making her more sappy. <sighs> but that's been my strategy. Yeah. Anyways, we appreciate you coming to the show. Yeah, we do. I hope you've learned a lot from us today. We've learned a lot about the 1800s and 1700s slangs and euphemisms. Please use them at your discretion. I will say many people will not get what you're saying to them, but you'll get a good laugh. Yep, that's true. Um, Let's cheers. Uh, Thanks for drinking my dickle. Welcome back. Oh, thank you. It's good to be back. Congrats on the house. Thank you. Well, got to do inspection next. I always say it's not over until it's over. But it's pretty new, so I can't imagine too much shit. Yeah, it's only four years old. Yeah, I can't imagine too much shit. Yeah, I I can't can't either, but I've been surprised before. So, Um, All right, thanks, everybody. Cheers to a Friday. Um, This episode will air on Monday. Check out our sponsor, My Cigar Pack, www.mycigarpack.com. Enter promo code HOT10 at checkout for $10 off your first pack. And visit our website, www.hotticketweekly.com, for news, reviews, and more. And last one, do a shout-out to our, our, our show sponsor, George Dickel. A Dickel's great in the mouth. All right. We'll be back at you next week <laughs> with episode 160. See everyone.